our next educator we have is Jim O'Donnell, and I'm excited about him coming. We usually invite him to the Sharpener's Jam because his ability to sharpen and the educational information he can give us is just pretty amazing. And I think you'll like the things he has to teach you. There's three tricks that you're going to learn, and so um, you're going to want to listen to all three tricks. So stay along with us to hear Jim O'Donnell's class. Hello, this is Jim O'Donnell. Thank you for coming to the class and thank you for attending the jam this year. It's been an interesting year, that is definitely for sure. Um, all of us are struggling right now, I'm sure, in one way or another uh, through all of this. But I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to be able to meet this way and thankful for Bonnie for putting this on. Uh, so, what she asked me to do was do something on thinners. So I figured I would go ahead and just show the basic sharpening that I do on a thinning shear for all customers. This usually takes care of 90 to 95 percent of all the problems with thinners that I run into. Thinners are really not all that different to work on than any other shear. It's just a matter of knowing a couple of additional little tricks that you need to do in order to make the shear function properly. So I've got a pair of thinning shears here. Um, it's just an old style uh, Wolf Industry sells one very much like this. Uh, it's the the uh, uh, 488, I think it is. I can't remember the the number on it um, or the 644. It's something like that. It's an even handled shear and uh, just great all around thinning shear, both for grooming and for the beauty industry. So we'll go ahead and we'll take this apart. So it's going to start by taking the tension knob off of the shear. Always make certain whenever you're taking your shears apart, number one, that you pay attention to how they came apart, and number two, that you have a safe place to actually put the parts of the hardware for the shear. So we'll put the spring plate in, and we'll take the screw out, and always make sure that your washer comes off with the screw. So we'll put that into its safe little spot and we'll get to work on the inside of the shear. Now I always do all of my work on the thinning shears before I do the sharpening on the inside of the shear. So we're going to start by working the inside. We'll set the shear down on the water stone and we're going to start by pulling the shear back. So we start about a 45 degree angle. We're going to start by drawing across the stone. So we'll just put one finger over the screw hole, make sure that the entirety of the ride is actually on the block itself, and then make sure that all of the shear is also on the stone as well. So, first finger over the hole, for next finger is going to be your first finger of your left hand, and then these fingers will basically be along for the ride. All the pressure is going to come from over the hole. I'm going to start by doing a draw back to just establish a line, and then I will go back and forth. I usually just do a few quick strokes just and then stop and you always want to come to a complete stop on the water stone before you lift off. You don't want to come off with motion. If you come off with motion it's very easy to radius the inside of the shear. I'm just going to wipe these down. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a look at the ride line. I don't know how well this is actually going to come out on the video and I apologize um, for the video itself. Uh, it's never easy to shoot in the light and get everything perfect when you're just trying to put together something for basically a YouTube type video like this. But we can see that we do have a ride line all the way across the shear. There aren't any washed out tips um, and it looks good all the way around. You can also see on this that it's double hollow ground. You can see it's hollow ground here and then it's hollow ground along the length of the blade as well. That has to be done because the blade drops down so much before the cut that you have to readjust the hollow on this area so that this can touch on the flat stone all the way around the ride area and then out to the tip. So this actually looks pretty good. So I'm going to do a few more strokes and go ahead and get this to where I have a good solid looking ride line. I'm going to do probably about maybe 10, 15, 20 backstrokes, come to a complete stop and then lift off. I'll wipe this down again. And then we'll take one more look. And you can see it's a fairly decent ride line all the way up to the tip. Still has a little bit of the nicks 
on the edge of the blade from where the teeth have been making contact with it. We're actually going to sharpen that up off and then we'll, we'll come back to the stone and we'll just re-establish that ride line after we're done with the sharpening as well. We just want to make sure that we have a well-established um, ride line before we actually start doing the sharpening. Now the key with a thinning shear is making sure that when you do the blade that has the teeth that you actually ramp the tips of the teeth. So the tips of the teeth here there's a ride line all the way around you can actually see just like any other shear starts at the early entry right behind the screw hole uh, where the ride area is all the way around the back side of the ride up over the top of the ride and then all the way down the blade to the tip like any hollow ground shear. There's also notches on the ends of the teeth. So you don't want to sharpen the tooth blade because you don't want to sharpen those notches away. The notches help to hold the hair in place and then a lot of the cut takes place actually at the bottom of the notches. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and just clean up the ride line on this blade and then we're going to ramp the tips of the teeth. And the reason that you need to ramp the tips of the teeth is as the blades, as the blades go over one another, as they make their cut, you want to make sure that the, the teeth don't bite into the straight blade. They're going to be able to ride over that straight blade a lot easier by doing that ramping. So, we'll put this right on the stone just like any other shear. Again, finger over the screw hole. First finger of the left hand in front of the right finger, first finger. And then we'll just, these fingers are along for the ride. I'm going to start do a stroke across the blade. I mean across the stone. And then I'll do a couple of strokes. And then stop. I'm going to wipe this down and then take a look at the work that I did. So I've reestablished my line. Really just a few strokes actually did it because the, the line itself actually looked pretty good to begin with. So let's see if we can get that in yeah. the video. So not bad. Came out fine. Actually just a few strokes took care of it. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to go onto the stone and I'm actually going to do the ramping process now. So when I do the ramping process, what I need to do is actually need to lift I'm actually going to lift up the spine just a little bit. Nothing huge, just enough to be able to get the actual ramp on the edge of the tip of the tips of the teeth. So I'm going to lift this up and I'm going to draw back. And as I draw back, I'm actually going to lift just a little bit. So I lifted just a little bit this way so that I could actually go from, because there's that edge radius that's there, there's that slight curvature to the blade, I want to make sure I get a ramp at the early entry of the cut and then have a ramp all the way down to the tips of the teeth in order to be able to do that and be able to roll up that, uh, that edge radius that's there as well. So we'll go ahead and wipe this down and then look for the ramp. Now, it may be hard to see the ramp and I apologize for that on the video. Um, there isn't going to be anything perfect with what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish with all of these things. Let's see if we can get that to clear in enough to be able to see it. You really can't. All I did was I just made a secondary ramp right up along the teeth. You'll actually be able to see it. It'll just be a nice little gleam across the tops of the teeth. Whether you can actually see it in the video, I'm not sure. Won't be able to tell until it's edited and then of course it'll be on smaller screens when you're watching it as well. So that's really the only difference in the steps of doing the ride line on a thinning shear. Just make sure that you're doing that ramping process because if you don't do the ramp you will have teeth that are going to bite into the other blade and it'll also feel much more crunchy. This will actually smooth the blade up for the stylist as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'll shut the camera off. I'm going to switch from the water stone and then move my uh, Hera 2 flat hone over to the left so I can do a little bit of sharpening on this. Okay, now that we have our machine in place, I'm going to go ahead and sharpen just the straight tooth blade. I'm not going to do the tooth blade because, again, we don't want to sharpen those notches off. Um, this is actually a semi-convex blade, so there is a very slight bevel at the edge. So you really don't have to do the convex on this. If you wanted to fully convex the blade, you could also do that as well. Um, many of your thinners, this again doubles as a grooming shear. So a lot of your thinners will have a very, very fine uh, bevel at the edge of the cut. Uh, this is what they call a semi-convex blade. So we'll just go ahead and just run with the bevel that's there. We're going to match it. I'm going to take this off here and we will grab just a 15 micron 
Now, for the sake of time on the video, I'm not going to go through the 30 and the 9 on the sharpening. Um, I know that Bonnie is doing a video on uh, basic sharpening, and I'm sure she's going to walk through all the different steps of the sharpening itself. Um, there are a lot of people that will just do just a 15 on the outer edge and then polish. It really depends on your style of sharpening, and it depends on what your customer's tastes are as well. If you want a much smoother and much shinier surface, you always want to make sure that you're going through all of the steps. You want to go through your 30, your 15, and your 9 in order to be able to smooth out the front surface of the blade. And then you can go ahead and do your polish after that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bring up a burr on this. This should probably be somewhere around 40 degrees or so. So I'm just going to put this on the plate and I'm going to go ahead and pull this fixture up here. If you've never used the Hera 2, the Hera 2 actually, let's pull this actually off of the plate because I'm going to tip this over see if we can see this. If I turn this sideways just a little bit, you can actually see that there is a little, t a little tick with an R on it, and it's set at 45 degrees right now. What I need to do is I need to set this for 40 degrees. So we'll turn this back over. I'm going to go ahead and loosen up this knob right here that holds everything in place. I'm going to rotate my R over to 40 degrees from 45. I'll reach over and tighten this up just to snug it. Just make sure that that's fully in line and then tighten that down. And now you can actually see that it's set for 40 degrees for a right-handed shear. That's what that R is for. The L would be for a left-handed shear. If you were doing a 40 degree shear though on a left-handed shear, it would actually be set at 50 because everything has to be reversed. 45 will always be the center, but 65 when it's a left-handed shear becomes the 25 and the 25 would become the 65 for a left-handed shear. So right now set for 40 degrees and we are ready to get going. So we'll go ahead and put this into the fixture. Now to insert this into the fixture you always want to make sure that you have the inside surface of the blade all the way up against the inside surface of the fixture's head. So we'll set this in, loosen this up and make sure that we seat that all the way down and then lock it into place. I know it's not easy to see in the video, but you just want to make sure that everything is solid. You want to make sure that it's flat all the way down. You want to make sure that there isn't any wiggle, and that's just seated all the way down into the, the, the bottom of the clamp and also up against the face of the inside of the jaw of the clamp as well. So now we're ready to get started. We're going to start the machine up. I'm going to go at about 50% speed, and we'll start the machine. So what I'm going to do is just a scratch test. It's going to do a light touch. And I'll turn this around to see the scratch on the surface of the blade. Um, it's right at the edge. It'll be hard to see in the video, but it's right there. So now what I'm going to do is just start by just starting at the early entry of the cut, pull back along the blade, make a couple of strokes until I see a burr start to form, form, and then lift up, feel for my burr. I have a burr that I just brought up, and I'm actually done with the sharpening at this point. Now, if I wanted to go start with a 30, I could have started with a 30. I could have then gone to the 15 and then gone to the 9 to smooth up the surface. Again, if you're going to be doing any convexing on this, you would actually do the rotation in order to be able to bring that burr up. And we'll actually do that in another segment of this video while we do some work on fixing a blade that has been beveled. So, we'll stop here, and then we'll take this out, and I am going to go ahead and deburr this. The way that I do the deburring is I actually use my towel that I have and I actually just pull the burr up and I'm just flip-flopping the burr and I'll pull the burr the opposite direction. I just want to get the majority of the burr as much as I can off of that blade. There's some people that'll use a brush and there's other people that'll use um, jean material and other materials like that to pull the burrs away. Some people will just go immediately just to the water stone but I like to pull the burr off with a nappy towel of some kind. So then after that, we're going to go back to the water stone. We'll work the inside of the blade, and then we'll come back over here and we'll do our polishing. Okay, now that we've worked the inside again and we know that we have a well-established line, we know that we've taken all of the nicks off of the blade from where the teeth had been making contact with the blade before, and we're basically ready to go back now and actually do our polishing. We're set up now for the polish, get our polishing disc on. We're going to go ahead and reclamp the blade back in the fixture. We'll start the machine up. 
And this time we're going to go all the way up to full speed, all the way up to 100%. And we're just going to work back and forth to polish the blade up. This is a felt pad with a 3 micron diamond paste on it. It's already been charged and ready to go. If you want to see how to actually charge this disc, there is a video that I did that's on YouTube, and I'll make sure that there's a link on the video, or perhaps it can be linked down at the bottom of the video during the jam as well, if you want to go and look at that. And I'm just doing my polish, making sure I get all the way to the tip and all the way to the throat. I'm going to do about maybe 20-25 strokes back and forth, then I lift straight off, and I shut the machine down, and I will remove the blade from the fixture. Just one other point too, if you're using this machine, always make sure that when you move, remove the blade from the fixture, take it out like this, just come straight up and out and away. I did an entire segment of a video one time when I was working for Wolf, and as I took the blade out, I actually drug the edge across the inside of the clamp by accident and had to reshoot an entire 20 minute segment that I did unbroken. That was a fun day. So, we've polished up the edge, it looks good. We're wiping it down right now. You can see it still has that slight bevel on it. Oops. Helps if I put it in the camera, doesn't it? I was looking in the light myself. Um, still have that slight bevel on it. And we are ready to go to put this back together and do our test cuts. Now that we've done the sharpening and we've deburred the blade, um, we're still going to do another deburr step. We're going to do that on the water stone just to make sure that all the burrs are pulled back. But it's just, I like to do that with the with uh, a nappy towel just because I like to make sure that as much of that burr is off of there as possible. I don't like to get the burrs embedded on my water stones. So we'll go ahead and start by just making sure that, that burr is pulled back and then we will move on from there. Let's go ahead and wet this stone down again. And we will start by drawing back. We're going to put that first finger over that hole again and just pull back to pull that burr back. I like to do it twice, so I'll go again. I'll just move forward just a little bit, or I'm sorry, backwards towards myself, um, and then pull again to help pull that burr back. Um, what that does, the double stroke, just helps to pull that burr all the way back and off of the edge. And now I can wipe any remaining burr that's on there off. I also like to go in and then wipe the stone down again too, just in case there's any residual burr that's left on there. And while I'm doing the work back and forth, I'm not digging into the stone and embedding burrs into it. So, finger over the screw hole on the right hand, left hand, first finger in front of that. Again, all that pressure is coming from here. And we're gonna go back and forth, just making sure that we have a well-established ride line. So we'll go back and forth. Come to a complete stop, lift off, wipe it down, and then we'll check our home line. All right, so let's see if we can get that to clear up. We'll turn that in light, and we can see within reason that we have a good, solid, nice, flat ride line. So we're ready to do our polish now. So we'll polish this up, and once we've polished it, we'll put it together. Okay, now that we've done our polish, we'll go ahead and put the blade back together. So we start out by making sure that we grab our washer. I always like to seat my washer right into the hole. That way I know it's in there, I know which direction it's in. Most of the time these are recessed holes, so there's a slight cupping to the washer. I always like to make sure that the washer goes in properly. I'm going to take my stud, put it through the hole. Once that's in the hole, I'm going to turn that around and with my first finger on my left hand, I'm going to hold that stud in place. I'll then take my blade with the teeth, slip it over the top of the blade. Now I can hold both blades with my left hand. I'll then go ahead and put my spring plate, my leaf spring back on, and then I'll put my tension adjusting knob on the tool. I'm going to lock that down. You don't want to over tighten it because you want to make sure that you're not going to chew the blade into the tooth blade as well when you're doing any kind of cutting on this. 
What I typically do is I'll take and I'll actually spread the blades just slightly and then just very, very lightly rub them together and open and close them a few times to make sure there isn't any residual burrs or any stickiness that I can feel. Remember, when you do the polish, you are still bringing up burrs. I'm going to go ahead and loosen this up just a little bit, but you want to make sure that thinners are actually a little bit tighter than just your average shear. You want to be able to let it fall into place and the teeth about make contact after you wiggle it just a little bit as it falls close to do the start of the cut. Now you still want to make sure that you seat your washer and seating the washer is important. A lot of times on these tools what will happen is, is that washer doesn't cup up under the hole of the head of the screw and if it doesn't what it'll do is it'll actually loosen up you can actually see where that's just free falling now where it wasn't before you need to make sure that you seat the washer so I'm going to do a click and do a test and now you can see it's about back to where it was supposed to be and this is actually ready for a test now there's a couple of different ways that you want to test this I can only show one in the video because I do have a mannequin head um, but the mannequin head is in my van, and my van is actually not with me right now. It is being repaired. So I'm going to go ahead and use a tissue. Now the reason that I use a tissue is, is I want to test the cut of the blade all the way to the tip and make sure that I'm actually cutting a good, nice, smooth hole all the way through the cut. You can actually see from the very early entry all the way up to the tip, I have individual holes that have been cut. This just allows me to see whether or not there's any dead spots on any parts of the blade. Um, it's just helpful for the visual of the cut itself. If you really want to test a thinner though, what you need to do is either have it tested on someone's head, so you can bring it back to a stylist and ask them to test it on a customer if a customer is sitting in the chair and they're doing a cut, or um, they, you can test it on a mannequin. You can also get uh, hair that it, they use for extensions that actually is attached uh, basically to a band and you can test that way and cut and pull out. What you're looking for is making sure that the teeth are not grabbing anywhere and then going to pull the hair out when you actually do the cut. Very important. I mean the customers don't like that and dogs for sure don't. Um, a groomer can very easily get bit if they're tugging the hair out of a dog when they pull a shear away from the animal. So just be cautious of that and be aware of that as well. That's basically the rundown on the basics of sharpening a thinner. Um, there are going to be times when you're going to run into ones that are going to make you want to bang your head up against the wall because you just can't figure out why they're not cutting. There's a number of things that can go wrong with thinners just like there's a number of things that can go wrong with any other shear. If you run into those types of situations, give Bonnie a call at Bonica Shears. You can give me a ring um, at On The Edge and we're happy to take care of you. I'll make sure that any information that I have for my newsletter that I do is at um, the bottom of the video and then there's also going to be contact information on how to get in touch with me as well. Uh, so just keep that in mind. So if you would, uh, we'll get ready to do the next part, portion of the video which is where we're going to do a reconvexing of the front surface of a scissor that has been pretty deeply um, beveled and it's actually supposed to be fully convexed. I'm just going to show you a couple tricks to speed that up and make it look a lot smoother when you're done. All right, now that we've shown how to do a thinning shear, I wanted to go ahead and show another issue that I run into quite a bit when it comes to doing work. I'm sorry for bumping the camera a couple times there on that. No, we're not going to change any edit around for that. A little bit of a snafu, but you can see here that this was definitely a snafu that was done to this blade. Uh, this has been ground with a flat angle on a convex shear. Now, the issue with, with this type of a, of a situation is, is this shear is really supposed to be fully convexed. And if it's not fully convexed, it's not going to cut properly. It isn't going to feel um, very good for the stylist. Uh, it's probably at a slightly shallower degree of angle, too. It's probably at 40. should be at at least 45 or 50, depending upon the steel of the blade. And uh, we just want to make sure that we correct that back to factory spec when we do the work. So we're going to do that on the hair or two. Um, we can do it with the clamp. And I'm just going to show a couple tricks that I do to make sure that when you actually do the convexing on the front surface, that the convexing portion of the blade looks really smooth and very uniform and very clamshell. You know, one of the reasons that they designed this was they wanted it to look like a clamshell. So there should really, from the spine down to the tip, as it gradually rotates down in that clamshell type of a look, they don't want any kind of a bump or a hump on any portion of that blade. And a lot of times when, you, when I see sharpeners do a correction on a blade like this, 
you can still see a little bit of the leftover of the hump. You really need to get rid of the hump on the back of the uh, angle of that edge in order to be able to fully convex that. And I don't just go straight in and start doing convexing on it. I actually deal with the hump first. So we'll show a couple ways that I do that. All right, so to start the sharpening process, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and knock the back of the hump on that edge um, down just a little bit. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to seat my blade all the way in the fixture. I'll go ahead and turn the machine on. I'm going to do it at about 50%. And you can see I actually have a 60 micron disc that's on there. Um, you want to use a 60 micron disc because it's going to do the most work with the least amount of effort and uh, it's going to actually speed the process up for you. So we'll start this up and instead of actually going right to the edge and I've matched my angle already, I'm actually going to go ahead and just turn slightly so that I'm going to be up on the back side of that, of that um, angle and I'm going to work back and forth just a few strokes and we'll show it to the tip. So I'm going to pull off I'm going to look and see what I've created. So I'm going to take this out I'll shut this off and Let's see if we can see what I created when I did that. What I'm shooting for, and this isn't easy to do with this video, is I'm looking for a double angle. And I don't know if you can see that very well. Just a little bit on the video. Sorry for the blurring. Uh, this is just a regular standard camcorder, so it has autofocus, which makes this a little more difficult to do. So I've knocked actually a secondary angle on the back side of this, and I'm going to do that again, actually, on the front surface. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the machine back on. I'm going to go back to where I was. I'm going to rotate back just a little bit more, and I'll make just a couple of quick strokes just to go ahead and cut another angle. So I'm basically going to have a faceted run of angles on the blade itself in order to be able to do the convexing on this. So let's see if we can get that to clear just a little bit. And we'll rotate that right around. You can see it's faceted on that front surface now. So now what I can do is I can go in and I can do my convex. So I'm going to go ahead, clamp the blade into the fixture, start the machine up, and now I'm actually going to do the convexing portion of the sharpening. So I'm going to rotate. I've already brought up a burr. And I'm going to make sure that I check my work. Rotate this back around. I don't want to go up any further than I have to with the 60 because I don't have to, want to have to take a whole bunch of scratches off of the front surface when I'm done. I'm going to go back just a little bit more to make sure that everything is nicely smoothed out. I'm just using very light pressure and letting the disc do the work. I'll go ahead and shut that down. And let's see if we can see what we've created. So let's go ahead and get this where we are. There we go. You can actually see how I've rounded that surface out. You can see where the rough cut is from the disc. And we're going to smooth that out with the 30 and then the 50 and the 9. And in this case, I have to go through all the different steps of the sharpening in order to be able to re-smooth out this convex front surface um, because there are such heavy scratches on the front surface of the blade right now. You have to be really careful because you will, all those scratches will show up. Anything that you miss during this process. So let's say that um, I do a convexing and I convex with the 30, but I don't get all the way back up to where the 60 was or a little bit past where that 60 was when I was doing the convex surface originally. Those will pop right back up when you do uh, the polish. Um, you can polish them out, but it takes a while to do it and you're just adding time and time is money, as we've often said in many of these videos. So we're going to switch now from the 60 to the 30. Set the blade in the fixture. Start the machine up. And rotate. And right now, mainly what we're doing is we're just trying to do a good cleaning of the blade as well. One other step that I would do if I was actually um, doing this for a customer instead of just doing the cosmetics on the front surface is I would have already gone to the water stone again to pull the, the 30, I mean the 60 micron burr off. I don't like to leave a real hefty burr on the edge at any point during the sharpening, um, except for when I'm doing the actual convexing portion of correcting the problem with the blade. Um, I don't want to have any real heavy bite on the blade uh, when I go to actually uh, put the shears back together 
and then I don't want them to cut into one another and tear each other apart. So I'm going to go ahead and wipe this down. I'm going to just flip flop the burr off that I just created with the 30. And this is mainly just to make sure that I'm actually getting a good convex smooth looking surface on the blade. So let's see if we can see this. And you can see here that the blade is smoothed out now. It's actually fully rounded. And there's no hump anymore. And that's really the most important step in the process. So remember, all I'm doing is just the cosmetics on the front surface of this blade for this video. There's other people that are doing videos on how to go through the different steps of sharpening. Plus, we just went through the steps of sharpening with the thinning shear. Um, I just want to do the cosmetic side of what we're working with here on this particular blade. So I'm not doing any inside work on this blade, but this is hollow ground. It needs to be worked on. I'm also doing this on purpose as well because we're going to do another segment of the video where we deal with a problem with the inside of the ride. But right here you can actually see we do have a very nice convex surface at this point. So now we're just dealing with the cosmetics of the shear. So we're going to switch from the 30 to the 15. set our blade into our fixture, start her up, and again, just making sure that we're doing our convexing on the front surface and removing any of the scratches from the 30. I'm also making sure that I go back just a little bit further each time so that I'm making sure I get that entire front surface and I'm not missing any areas on the blade. Now that that's done, I'm going to go to the 9. Start this up, and again, making sure that I have a nice smooth, nicely sharpened surface that is just have the scratches removed from all the different areas on the blade. So when I do my polish, my polish will come out nice and shiny. Alright, so I'm going to wipe this down. I'm going to flip flop my burrs, pull those burrs off of there, and let's see if we can see the work that's been done. So you can actually see this is a nicely convex shear now, fully rounded all the way back out to the edge with no hump that's left over because of the angle that was there before. All right. So of course now this would come out, this would go on the water stone and we would do work on the inside before we do the polishing. Again, this is just the cosmetic portion of this. So for the sake of time on the video, we're not going to go through that step. This is not the norm for sharpening. Again, this is going to go back into the fixture of the clamp. We'll start this up all the way up to full speed. I always like to go ahead and kiss my edge a few strokes and then do some polish. When I'm doing a convex shear, I'll come back and do a few more strokes at the edge to make sure I'm catching my edge. And again, same thing. A few more strokes at the edge. I'm just going to do cosmetic work at this point. So I'm going to make sure I'm getting my tip. I'm going to make sure I'm getting my throat. I'm going to go back towards the back edge, making sure that I get in the early entry of the shear. I'm going to actually do what's called a progressive edge going back up and then back down. This is to actually disturb some of the scratches. And I'm always going to finish by coming straight up off of the plate. Shut that down. I'm going to wipe all of the polishing trash off of the shear and see how we did. All right, now we have a nice, fully polished shear. Very little scratches in it. Um, I'm sure it's not absolutely perfect. My light is not the best for this where I'm shooting this video. I tried to get into an area of my house where it's as uh, lit as possible. But we have a nice, smooth transitioning um, convex from the spine all the way out to the edge. And very little scratches, if any. Uh, I'm going to turn this light on, so forgive that in the video. I'm going to look in a magnifier just to check this. And um, it's a, a very nice little setup that we have uh, on my machine where it's got the light and the magnifier and uh, I'm just going to actually check the work that I did which actually looks pretty good. So 
that's really the steps that I use in order to be able to reconvex a shear and you know, make it where it's back to factory spec as much as possible. Uh, when you're out in the field, you can't get everything perfect every time, but the reality is you can do really good work while you're out in the field uh, just knowing a few tricks of the trade, and this is one of them. So the next thing that I'm going to show is actually how to chamfer the inside of a scissor. You can actually see at this point on this blade, we've actually removed all of the ride line that was on the inside of this, but we also have a, quite a bit of a step down on the on the blade itself. So I'm going to put this on a water stone in the next segment of this video, show what happens and then show how to correct this area to be able to bring everything in line to be able to create a new ride line that's nice, a nice transition from the back of the ride all the way out to the tip. All right, now that we've gone through a thinning shear and we've gone through how to reconvex a shear that's been beveled, let's take a look at a shear that actually has a problem uh, with the edge itself where it has been ground down into the shear and now you're not going to be able to establish a very good ride line in the early entry when you work on the stone. So let's start by working on the stone some and see if we can show what happens in the video. So again, same process that we went through before. We're going to put first finger over the hole and we're going to draw back. I'm going to work back and forth and then we're going to stop. And you can actually see that there's kind of an area right in here on the water stone where you can see the really the blade is not making contact with the stone. And that's because it can't because it's four points of contact are out of alignment. So this is the geometry of the shear that you're often hearing about. So here you can see in the back edge of the shear, oops, let's see if we can do this. Sneak around the camera here put my hand up and see if we can do that a little better. There we go. It's a little bit better. You can actually see right here and this portion of the ride comes around over the back side, comes here, it touches here and then it touches out towards the tip area of the blade. Starts at about right here but then dies for the remainder of the blade. And that's because when this is making contact, instead of it making contact here, here, this is four points, point, one point here, point two, point three, and then point four is all the way along the blade to the tip. It actually has a fifth point of contact. One point here, point, point, there's another point, then it starts to touch here and then down. So what we need to do is we need to relax this back. We need to actually remove this back. So we're going to actually grind some of this off, and it's called chamfering that edge. And by removing that edge, we'll be able to recreate our home line to make it look proper on the, the blade. Let's see if we can look at it and see how that ride line looks right now in the video. So you can see how we have it at the tip. We have it at the um, ride area and back and around, but we have a dead spot right in this area of the blade right here. We're going to correct that by correcting this. Alright, so the best way to actually do the chamfering of the inside edge is on the Okami Gold or the Twice as Sharp. In this case we have the Okami Gold here. It has the 800 grit diamond wheel. This is going to make a nice smooth looking edge. You're going to have your clamp that you're going to get set up to do the work. Um, on the clamp what I want to do is actually want to set the clamp for at about 55 to 60 degrees. So I'm going to actually set the clamp where the two parts of the clamp comes together. It forms a line. I'm actually going to go just a little bit beyond the 55 degree mark. Sometimes you can go a little further on some clamps than on others. And I'm going to clamp the shear in. But the difference in this and how you would normally clamp this clamp in on the Okami Gold is typically you're going to clamp it in with the inside of the blade facing you. In this particular case I want to make sure that I'm clamping with the inside of the blade facing the wheel because I'm going to be doing work on the wheel itself. You also want to make sure that you clamp this in the clamp where it's about two, about two thirds of the screw hole is exposed or maybe just a little bit more. Just make sure that you get a good firm clamp on the shear and make sure that it's straight as well across the wheel. Once this is clamped into place in the sharpened position, so there is a sharpened position that's on the clamp. You can see there's it says sharpened. Oops, let's get that around this way. 
So it's sharpened on this portion of the clamp, and if I roll this over, I don't want to bang that edge if I can help it. It says hone right. You actually want to put it with the hone right up on top, and what that does is it flips the clamp over, and it's going to let us push this through to the wheel, and that way we can make contact with the wheel to do the chamfering. So now what we're going to do is start the machine up. So I'm just going to start by touching the blade up against the wheel. I'm actually going to remove that material from the inside. Now, this takes a little bit of practice. You don't want to go too crazy with this. Never stop a machine with your fingers. Right? Do as I say, not as I right do. Um, we want to make sure that we don't do this to the point where... Let me rotate this up so I can get at the camera some. Um, where we actually cut this in past where the early entry of the cut begins, which you can actually see where I've chamfered off the inside of this blade. So you can actually see that. I'm going to continue to go down until I'm in line where I've brought the early entry of the ride line in line with the early entry of the cut. So I need a few more strokes. If you go over a little bit, you know, don't worry about that. That's just, again, get a pair of shears, an old pair of shears, kind of mess them up. Practice, do it again, do it again, until you build up some confidence doing this. It's really not that difficult to do, it just takes a little bit of practice. And that's that. So let's pull this up. Let's see what I did here. And you can actually see that I've chamfered that edge and brought it all the way up to right where the early entry of that cut is just wanting to begin. So that's the trick. I might have even gone just a smidge too much. I probably would have liked to have had that back just a little bit. Um, but fortunately, they don't cut in the early, early, early entry of that cut. So now you can see this is all in line. So what I'm going to do now is I'll take this out and I'll go back to the water stone and we're going to recreate that line all the way from the ride area, all the way up to the tip so there's no broken portion of that line in this area of the blade. All right, so now that we've chamfered the inside of the shear, we're going to go ahead and correct that ride line. So you can see here where that ride line is really just mainly at the tip. And we're going to reestablish that on this side, this back side of the chamfer, from that early entry up and still making our proper contact on the back side of the ride area. So we'll put our water stone down and we'll work back and forth and bring that up. Now, this is a 5,000 grit water stone. Um, so, I mean, you could go with a 2,000 grit or a 1,000 grit, possibly bring this up a little quicker. Really depends. I have all of those different stones, but you can actually see now just from the uh, the, the discoloration on the stone that's coming, that's the, that's the water. The, you can see the metal coming off of the blade, and you can see it's most certainly much further across the entire length of the blade now compared to what it was you know, when we did this originally in the first part of this portion of the video. So, let's take a look and see how we did. All right, so we have a ride line around the back. A ride line that's been established underneath that chamfer that I created. And now the ride line goes all the way down the edge, all the way out to the tip. Um, tip of the ride line is a little thicker than I like, but you know, of course, that was already there before. Plus, there was some ride line that was a little thick on that portion. That, you know, all of these blades that I'm using here have been used in different um, presentations over time. These were kind of junk shears that were just floating around that. You know, couldn't be used in any other way. But you can see we've reestablished an entire ride line now all the way down the blade. Uh, and this is this is a very important thing to know when you're actually doing the sharpening that's out there. There's, there's numerous ways to accomplish this. Um, there's a number of people that are out there now that are making um, equipment and uh, they're showing different techniques for re-hollow grinding the shear and that's fine. That works well. Um, in fact, that's probably more factory pure to do it that way. But a lot of times those pieces of equipment are not readily available when you're out in the field. It certainly is not uh, as readily available if you're working inside of a salon. Um, and this would actually work well for you. It's very easy to put together. Um, you can see the system that I actually have here. Uh, you can see my roll around that I use when I go into salons. Um, I have room on the bottom for both of my machines and then I can do all the work right on the top. 
Um, this is actually something that I got. It's a uh, Stanley Rolling uh, Mobile Workstation. Um, great piece. Uh, I wish that they still sold it here in the United States. They have similar type of products now and you can pick them up sometimes on Amazon as well. Um, you can find a lot of this information for some of these mobile stations on my blog. My blog, by the way, is Jim Sharp. Um, and to find my blog, just go to Google and put Jim and then Sharp and then blog. Don't put Jim Sharp because there's a Jim Sharp that's a bull rider and a Jim Sharp that is also a, um, uh, a radio uh, broadcaster or a DJ. And uh, so... <laughs> It was funny when I decided to come up with that name, uh, Jim O'Donnell was such a benign name, it was hard to get any search results. I went with Jim Sharp and then ran into that situation. But if you put Jim and then Sharp and then blog, it'll take you right to my blog. And it has a lot of this information, as well as how to dress the water stones, um, a number of other videos that I've done over time are linked um, on the blog, and then also uh, where you can get these mobile workstations as well still. Uh, it's just a great little piece. It actually comes apart in three pieces, uh, so it can go right into the trunk of a car. Um, very, very versatile uh, station. If you're as long as you're not much more than six two, uh, they're pretty comfortable to work on. Um, I am about five nine, so I just put a board over the top, and I didn't have to raise it up. If you're going to be much over six feet, you're going to want to put something else underneath this to lift this up just a little bit to make it comfortable enough to work on. Um, other than that, just uh, I know that Bonnie, when she does an announcement for me, will probably just mention my newsletter. My newsletter is On the Edge. If you wanted to find that online, it's O-T-E Newsletter. So it's O-T-E and then newsletter.com is my uh, website. But you can also find a link to that on my blog at Jim Sharp Blog. Um, and it'll explain everything that I do with the newsletter. That newsletter comes out once a month um, and is specifically for professional sharpeners like ourselves. So again, any questions, don't hesitate to give a shout. Um, I'm sure that uh, as this is rolling out live for the Sharpeners Jam, uh, that I'll be on and I'll be watching and I'll be see if I can answer some questions um, as we do this as they come up. And I'm sure there might even be a question and answer session afterwards. I'm not sure how Bonnie is going to do this. Thanks again to Bonnie for actually putting this together. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how it turns out. And uh, we just, uh, we're looking forward to being able to get back to work soon all around the country. I'm able to do a little bit of work now. Um, just did some sharpening this week for a couple of stylists that are getting ready to go back to work. Um, I'm sure that many in the country will start to do this as well. And I'm looking forward to that time. Y'all stay safe, stay well, and we're looking forward to seeing you. Thank you, Jim. And you're so right. We need to have any kind of discussion questions. We'll be open a little while before we go to our next class so that you can put any kind of questions up there. And Jim, I hope that you'll go ahead in the Sharpeners Jam chat, uh, Sharpeners Jam group chat, put in all your link information and how to get in touch with you in the newsletter. And I do want to say, all the educators that are coming to our jam this year and other years, they're not being compensated. <laughs> uh, we would like to be able to, but they're giving out of their desire to teach. So please support them. We ask that you support all our educators. If they have products, if they have things that can be of use to you, please let them know how much you appreciate the education they're giving you. and. Um, want to patronize the people that want to give back to youth.